All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization on this fine uh, February 13, 2020. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we begin, um, if you're in the audience, uh, anyone wishing to speak to, or to make a comment on an item on the agenda should complete a speaker card at the sign-in desk. For items on the agenda, fill out the speaker card and you will be called upon when the item is discussed. Comments are limited to three minutes. All right, thank you and welcome. P reports 3A, Executive Director's Report, Georgiana. Yes, well, welcome everyone. Um, Happy New Year, actually, because we did not have a meeting in January. And also, uh, congratulations to our officers and uh, our committee appointments, um, which, uh, oh, there, there they are. <laughs> Lisa was gonna roll it up, so thank you very much for, uh, for your service. In your package on page one, there are several recurring reports that are included for your information each month. Uh, such, such as a status of projects, our public engagement report, and so on. So please review those at your convenience. If you have any questions, please let us know. I also wanted to let you know uh, the Space Coast TPO member orientation was held on January 9th. Uh, these are, this was for new members, but existing members could also attend. And it was really to kind of assist our committee and our board members better understand their role in transportation planning. Um, we included in your attachments, there's a summary report with member feedback because we wanted to know how we were doing and what we could do better. Um, if you were not able to make the orientation and, and you would like to, to see what it's about or learn more, um, there is a link on that summary report to our website and you can watch the orientation at your convenience and see what kind of questions were asked. So that is there for you as well. Um, I'm also available for monthly uh, briefings to discuss the agenda. If there's anything on the agenda you have any questions about, of course, you can pick up the phone and call me. Um, but if you would like to have a standing meeting uh, on your calendar, we can also do that as well. And you can let Lisa and I know about that. We adopted our governing board strategic plan last July, and it was developed to guide policy development and provide a clear direction on specific emphasis areas that impact our community. So in your package, we've provided a one-page summary uh, progress report that reflects the emphasis areas of our board, which is safety, linking transportation with land use, sustain sustainability and resiliency, innovation and leadership. And at the bottom, you will see the activities that we have done to accomplish these goals and performance measures for each emphasis area. So that is there for your information as well. As a reminder, our first uh, Space Coast TPO member retreat will be held on April the 24th from 8.30 to 12 p.m. It's just in the morning. And it's gonna be at the Center for Collaboration in Rockledge. Uh, and the meeting is for our board members and our committee members, as well as our modal partners. Um, the theme will be innovations that move us. And so uh, we are plan on having uh, presentations on connected and autonomous vehicles. We would like to have uh, Virgin Trains has agreed to uh, be present to kind of talk about crossing gate and signal technology from a safety perspective and the ease of using the train, Space Florida. And then we would like to end the presentation or the, the event on uh, innovative funding because that's really kind of the problem that we're all having on a local and state level. So we can talk about some short-term and long-term funding strategies. So uh, please mark your calendars. We would very much be appreciative for, for our members to be there. Also in your package is the MPOAC legislative newsletter and for uh, any new members that we have, that is of course the Florida Metropolitan Planning uh, Organization Advisory Council. And the MPOAC really assists us in carrying out the transportation planning process by serving as a, a, the principal forum for collective policy discussion. It's where all the, the 27 MPOs get together. MPO staff monitors transportation related legislation and can reach out to a bill sponsor uh, to get more information. So if there are any transportation related bills you have any questions about or you would like for us to follow up on, uh, 
please let us know and, and we can certainly do that. I do want to bring uh, something to your attention. There are a pair of bills in the House and the Senate that are mid-block crossing bills related to ped pedestrian safety, and, and you probably have heard about these bills. The bills originally were intending to have every mid-block crossing install a set of signals, and this is the full three light signals, or remove the mid-block crossing. And when I say mid-block crossing, of course, I'm talking about a pedestrian crossing between intersections. So, you know, tra traffic control devices such as a full traffic signal or a pedestrian hybrid beacon, which is a hawk, must meet a higher national standard than the rectangular rapid flashing beacon, which is the RRFBs that we currently have on A1A. So the Senate bill was heard uh, in the committee and the bill sponsor uh, seems interested in making some changes that would lessen the financial impact. Um, on the House side, an amendment was filed late Friday, and it requires that any mid-block crossing with no more than two lanes of traffic and a speed limit of 35 miles per hour or less can have an RRFB, but it has to meet that criteria. Um, and so, of course, that would rule out A1A because that is four lanes of traffic. So f statewide, there's a lot of concern um, due to uh, unintended consequences. So at your place, you have a letter from Forward Pinellas, which is the MPO for Pinellas County, that breaks down a few of those immediate concerns that I just kind of wanted to, to touch on just a few of them. And one of them is converting an RRFB into a traffic signal or a pedestrian uh, hybrid beacon uh, the devices are not interchangeable. In other words, it's, it's unfortunately not a situation where you can pop out a yellow light and put in a red light. Um, so the House of Representatives staff analysis uh, uh, looked at it and it would cost roughly around $300 uh, each. 300000 Three, Excuse me, $300,000 yeah. each. Um, and DOT reports about $47 million to convert their mid-block crossings to the pedestrian hybrid beacons, and so that's throughout Florida. The other point that was made in the letter, uh, and of course, you know, it's an unfunded mandate, so this would not only affect DOT, there's a, many, many local governments uh, that use this sort of treatment. Pinellas County alone has 400, um, so some local governments would likely have to remove the RRFBs completely with no replacement design option, which really can enforce, um, you know, that culture of speed. Uh, and of course, we know that red light running is a big problem here in Florida. The other point, uh, FHWA endorses the RRFBs due to the motorist yield rates. So they talk about a lot of studies, one in particular, uh, that showed the compliance increase from 2%, the motorist yield rate, uh, prior to the installation of the RRFBs to more than 90% afterwards. Um, and so th w the last point in the letter is that maybe a more effective approach would be to increase the funding for education and enforcement, um, you know, such as high visibility enforcement, making it a year-round activity. So again, pedestrian safety is not wrong. Uh, we are very appreciative of what our legislators uh, are doing and, and looking at this very complicated issue um, because Florida has a reputation of, of injuring and killing our pedestrians and cyclists at a rate than, than any other state. So uh, we, we see that the legislators are being very thoughtful and they're working on uh, some possible amendments so it would not be so much of a financial impact. Uh, but because we're having a discussion on A1A in just a little bit, I felt it was really important for you all to understand what the discussion is statewide. Um, and so, uh, if there's, are there any questions on that? Yes, sir. Yeah, Mayor Johnson. I have some comments from that. Okay. Uh, is this the proper time or at the, later in the me meeting where it's on the? It, it w during the agenda. A1A discussion, we're really going to get into it much deeper. Uh, so, you know, is it about specifically the legislation or just? It's about my personal feelings gotcha. on this at this point, it which might I think be, is held by others. Yes, right. I'm, I'm sure it is. It might be better, yeah, if we, uh, Mayor, if you if you held it to the A1A discussion. Yeah, the five C. Yes, that would be good. Okay. Commissioner Isnardi. Yes. Uh, do we have uh, injury or fatality uh, data on Pinellas County over 
RFPs? We do not. Um, Paul, it, it appeared to me in the letter that he, he basically said their statistics when they ran their five-year uh, uh, statistical data, their problem was at red lights and, uh, you know, motorists turning right, uh, you know, at an intersection. And that seemed to be where their biggest problem was. But uh, we could certainly, you know, kind of get a rundown from that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Madam Mr. Chair, Google. It might, might be helpful to know. The legislation that's pending has uh, <coughs> has basically come out of two counties, Brevard, because of the situation in Satellite, satellite Beach that we're all familiar with, but also in Alachua County, uh, Senator Perry, who's the uh, senator in that area, uh, is sponsoring this legislation. They had uh, uh, two individuals that I, th I think were killed uh, mm -hmm. in, in a, in a crosswalk so. up there, and that's, that's what st has stimulated this legislation. Um, in the early travels through some of the earlier committees, it was uh, from from somebody that was attended those meetings for the MPOAC I, I talked with. It, it seemed to be apparent that many of the legislators really didn't understand uh, the issues at hand. They didn't understand uh, the gravity of, uh, of some of these crosswalk uh, deaths. Uh, and how it's how it's affected uh, various communities in the state. Number one, and then number two is there was initially uh, in some of the earlier committee meetings uh, no discussion really about the cost uh, mm -hmm. of retrofitting uh, the crosswalks uh, or where the money is going to come for that. So, okay. all right, very good. Um, two uh, more things. Um, I'd like to ask Kim to come up. Uh, we just have a standing spot for her to come up and, and talk about the Vision Zero. Speaking of safety, uh, and give yeah, us an update. Keep you in the loop about um, you. You did as a board endorse a Vision Zero resolution um, at the middle of last year. So we want to keep you up to date on activities with that. Before I do that, just to put some numbers to what Georgiana was telling you. The national average for pedestrian fatalities is about 16% of all traffic fatalities or pedestrians. It's 23% in Brevard County. So we need to do, we need to make sound decisions and we need to do the best thing for our pedestrians because we're even higher than the national average. Just, just to put some numbers to it. So speaking of Vision Zero, we had our second task force meeting on the 31st of January and a shout out to that group. We have a great group of people around the tables that are, that are passionate about what we're doing, believe in what we're doing. So we, we really thank them for their efforts. It was a very important meeting in the fact that they got the data from Brevard County and not to leave you guys out, we're gonna be rolling that out to you over your meetings. We couldn't do it all in one meeting. So we'll be doing that in upcoming meetings. Um, it, we saw the high injury networks for all fatalities, bike ped fatalities. And our next workshop, well, they actually decided looking at the data, we'll do an education campaign and the corridor that was decided on will be the A1A corridor, corridor in Cape Canaveral. Um, that is one of the, the highest injury networks for our vulnerable road users. So we're put, still putting together the details of what that will be. Um, but we'll, we'll certainly keep you up to date. And I just want to say, I know a lot of people they hear that Vision Zero and they just say there's no way. Well, there's encouraging news. Places that have been doing it Two cities, Oslo and Helsinki. I know neither one of them are in the United States, but they've been doing it a lot longer. Both of them in 2019 had zero bike ped oh deaths. Gosh. So, there, and I think Oslo had one traffic fatality total. So, it is attainable. We just got to keep moving forward. All right, thank you. And then the very last thing, uh, Steve wants to quickly talk about the long range transportation plan and all the public involvement that we've been yep. doing. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to give you a quick update on where we're at in our long range plan. Um, <coughs> as you remember, a year or so ago, we did our first public survey. We used the results from that survey to develop our goals and objectives, which you adopted back in July. And so we now have our second public survey available and we have this fun video on social media that I will show you guys to try to capture everyone's attention and get some more responses. 
transportation system starts with you. What you like, what you don't like, you know, choices. No, not those choices. Whether you favor economic development, safety, travel options, preserving the environment, or a clever blend of them all, click your pick. Pop over to the survey at voiceyourvisionbrevard.com and help choose the future of local transportation because your choices matter. Got something to say? Hit the survey at voiceyourvisionbrevard.com. And so we've been getting a lot of great feedback on it so far. We've gotten around 3,000 responses. Um, but we'd like it if you guys could all share the survey through all your channels. And we do have a couple of public workshops coming up. Um, that the, everyone's invited to attend. I send everyone here a uh, personal invitation. And so our next one is at the City of Satellite Beach at uh, City Hall on February 18th. And then our one after that is on February 19th at West Melbourne at the Veterans Memorial Complex. So we hope to see you there. And thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Georgiana. Next item is 3B, the Technical Advisory Committee and Citizens Committee uh, Advisory Committee. We call it the TACCAC, so uh, Georgiana. Yes, uh, the Technical and Citizen Advisory Committee met on Monday, and at your place you have a, a summary of actions and attendance from the meeting. The committees recommended the TPO approve uh, the meeting minutes, the TACCAC meeting minutes of December 9th, and approval of the transit asset management plan. Uh, they received presentations on the 2020 census, uh, the US-1 corridor study, and the A1A pedestrian safety. Um, the committees were very favorable um, of the short-term engineering recommendations uh, that the DOT presented for A1A. I did wanna let you know that. Uh, no one spoke negatively about those recommendations. Uh, and the presentation, uh, some of the comments were that it did seem to kind of clear up some, a few of the misconceptions uh, um, that they have been hearing. So I uh, wanted to let you know that. All right, thank you, Georgiana. So I'll need a motion for approval of the uh, uh, report. So moved. Second. All right, I have a motion by uh, Commissioner Lober, second by Ms. Minus. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And I vote aye and the motion passes. Item 3C <coughs> is the Bicycle, Pedestrian, and Trails Advisory Committee report and Sarah Crom. Good afternoon, I'm Sarah Crom, the Multimodal Program Specialist. The BPAC, or the Bicycle Pedestrian Trails Advisory Committee, met January 27th. Some of the action items included electing their 2020 officers. We also adopted our 2020 action plan. For those that aren't aware, at the beginning of each year, we set out what actions the BPAC would like to accomplish that year. Um, we approved the BPAC award nominations that will be presented at this board next month. We've also been working with the Indian River MPO on a regional trail to connect the two counties. And so we presented the current alignment to, for our BPAC approval, and they were thrilled to see a new regional trail um, potential, or a potential <laughs> new regional trail. And that um, alignment will be coming to this board sometime later this year, probably in the next month or two. I also wanted to draw your attention to a couple of events that we have coming up. The flyers are in your package. The first is the Trail Trifecta. And basically, this is three events all combined in one in the city of Titusville. And so the Florida Bicycle Tourism Conference is Bike Florida's first ever con summit that they're doing in regards to that link between tourism and our cycling community. Also, we are proud to be hosts or co-hosts for the St. John's River to Sea Loop Summit this year. This will be the third year that they've held this summit. And so th that will be two days, March 19th, and then a half-day action plan workshop with OGT, Office of Greenways and Trails, on March 20th. Finally, Titusville Area Chamber of Commerce will be holding their annual ride on the regional trails that this board and our committees have helped fund and move forward. And so it's gear up, ride it down too. So there's lots of fun things to do in Titusville that week, as well as also um, Dan Burden, who's um, a wonderful speaker, will be speaking. The second one is just to save the date for our BPAC, this year's BPAC walking workshop. We regretfully had to cancel last year's, but we're gonna be able to charge forward with this one. Uh, March 30th, we will be on Hickory Street, the brand new complete street in Melbourne. All so. Right. 
you Mayor Very Meehan, good. we'd love to have you come out and Absolutely. stroll with us. So I will. Um, so uh, you, everyone's invited to come. You know, yes, we call it our BPAC walking workshop, but obviously it's open to everybody. So, and oh. that's all I have today. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions for Sarah? All right, seeing none. Thank you. All right, 3D, Transportation Disadvantaged Local Coordinating Board Committee. Scott Nelson. Thank you. It's good to be with you today. Yeah, welcome. I'll give you a little overview of the last TD LCB meeting. We welcomed our new chair, uh, Council Member Ma uh, Young there, and thank you very much. Did a great job conducting the meeting. Um, as to the CTC report, I covered a number of things in that meeting. I, I'll just highlight a couple of them for you. Um, we are getting some new bus orders. We received uh, the first of four 30-foot uh, Freightliner buses. Those will go into our paratransit service, mm. and we'll get three more of those in the next three months. Uh, we are going to get the first of two uh, trolleys, beach trolleys, uh, in two weeks. Uh, I've oh, seen wow. the pictures of it. It's, it's, it looks real nice. Uh, blue trolley with lots of trim and cool things on that. We'll put that into service on Route 9. The second one will be about a month behind. Uh, then mm. we're going to get three new uh, Ford 24-foot E450 buses in the next two months also, so quite a bit of new equipment. Um, we are gearing up for uh, some actually breaking ground on bus shelters. We've been talking about those for a long time. We have 14 in the pipeline, uh, two are in Vieira, four in Merritt Island, uh, five on Satellite Beach, and one in Rockledge and two on John Rhodes in Melbourne, and so we're excited mm -hmm. about that. And finally, we're involved in contract negotiations with the ETA Transit for our ITS project. Our progress goes a little slow on some of these projects, but uh, we're hoping to get that equipment installed shortly. Uh, as far as other happenings at that meeting, uh, there was a planning grant report. There was a TD performance report card uh, shared. We had a guest, uh, Stephen Bostel, came and presented on the long 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan. He was a guest at the meeting. And then Judy Pizzo from FDOT uh, also presented on the Florida Transportation Plan. And um, so it was a very good meeting. All right, very good. Any questions for Scott? All right, Commissioner Lober. The, the shout out to the question. I wanted to give a, uh, a shout out to Myra, the Merritt Island Redevelopment Agency, for having offset a substantial portion of that cost yes. for the four shelters in Merritt Island. Absolutely. Oh, very good. We're very appreciative of that. Yeah, very good. Yep. Yeah, Ms. Minus. Um, Chair, I'd like to ask, um, are those vehicles, are they in addition to, they're not replacing any current vehicles mm -hmm. that we All have All but now? two of them are replacement vehicles for ones that have the paratransit buses that are averaging 200,000 miles on them. They're 20. 11 through 2013 models so they've exceeded their useful life and they'll they've, they've been depreciated so they'll be auctioned okay so yeah. they're replacing yeah two the two two of the 30 foot freight liners are for expansion okay thank so you sir the other ones are all replaced all right anyone else all right mr johnson jordan excuse me <laughs> I, i'm all right okay. all right all right, <laughs> all right. Excuse all right. Yeah, mr jordan nice. please Just, forgive um, me not a problem <laughs> Um, bus shelters, how do you uh, determine where, the, where they go? Uh, uh, it's kind <laughs> of, yeah. Titusville yes. had, uh, that, that project was yeah. completed with 14 shelters up there okay. uh, a couple of years ago. We will loop back around for other locations, but some of these people have been waiting a long time, and so we're finally trying to play catch up with them. You, you didn't answer the question. Yes. How do you determine where they go? Um, it's, it's kind of first come first served and we have a priority list. I, okay. I wish I could tell you a better process. It's a little bit okay. subjective. Okay. Are you talking about the town or the area within the town? I'm just talking about it. the town. Hmm? The town. He's not saying where, which town it goes to. He's, how do you determine it within? Oh, I'm sorry. That's that's what the question is. The actual location. Yeah. We try to put them on the most used bus stops. 
you know, where, where, we, where we know the people are gathering. We don't want to put one out in a place where, you know, where there's nobody there. We don't have super good statistics of, of uh, bus stop level ridership stats. We get that input, again, kind of subjectively from the drivers. We always check with them. Where are you picking up people at? And then from, you know, from other things that we know. But the, this ITS project is going to give us hard numbers for every stop in the whole entire system. And that will be really helpful for projects like that. All right, so you just answered two questions. One I didn't ask, and the yeah. second. So it still it still sounds subjective, though, as far as where you. I admit it. So yeah, okay. So you're the one to determine where they go. No, not. I meet with our people, with Terry, and with other people at our place. Okay. And sometimes with city officials. Okay. Uh, in the Vieira ones, for instance, we've met with Eva Ray, and and she's helped us. She's a community. Uh, representative from the Vieira company and you know we've had a lot of discussions with her over the years. Sure. Good afternoon everyone. Terry Jordan. I'm the planner for Space Coast Area Transit. And to kind of add to Scott's uh, answer, we work directly with the cities where we're installing the shelters. In most places a lot of them have been previously identified before I got here. We may tweak the locations but we work looking at our ridership numbers, okay. our um, information from our operators and then directly with the municipalities and cities where the shelters are being installed. Okay. Thank you. All right. Ms. Koss? Yeah, just my question yes. was specifically about <coughs> Coco because you didn't mention it. And I know that, are we not on the list? Where? Because I know we put aside monies where? for <laughs> foundations. Coco. Coco. Yeah. We've and had discussions we uh, with the city. And uh, there are a few shelters in, in the city of Coco, but not enough. And we are hoping to put some up there as well. There's only two. Not yeah. too many at yeah. the current time. Oops. You're right. It's not too many. They don't need yeah. We will be yeah. talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy to Yeah, I, th I right. thought we were, actually. <laughs> All right. yeah. I'll be glad to talk to you. All right. Yes. Are you done, uh, Ms. Goss? All right, uh, Commissioner Lover. All right, Scott, I'm going to put you in an uncomfortable spot here. I apologize. With respect to Coco, have you had any problems uh, communicating with their staff insofar as this or any other projects are concerned? Because I know the elected officials are all great. Yeah, no. Uh, no, we've, we've done fine. We had a meeting at City Hall. Uh, not as probably four or five, six months ago, and we discussed matters like that, bus service as well as shelters bus stops. The city was super helpful with us, working with us on Cocoa Transit Center. That, that was an acute need over there. I appreciate it. So that was a city staff, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mayor Williams? That was the staff, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, right. you. Thank you. All right. City Mr. Manager. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Yeah. Excuse okay. me. Um, I, I certainly would suggest, and I don't know how the process works, but what I just heard should not be acceptable as far as process is concerned. We've got to make sure that we're treating everybody equally. And he's a, admitted that it's kind of subjective how we put these shelters in. So I would think that we would want to have something that is ironclad so everyone knows exactly how the, pro the process works. Right now, we don't know how the process works. OK. Right? All right. So who does that? We could develop better guidelines for that. OK. All Thank right. you. Probably a good suggestion. Thank uh, you. Commissioner Snardi. Um, and, and I was going to say, you did say, though, that you try to be fair, at least as far as Absolutely. making rotations with where yeah. you're putting them, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I mean, you're probably getting beat up enough at this point for, yeah. for yeah. I mean, for being so responsive <laughs> and finding a way for us to get that extra stop at Heritage High School. It was, yeah. it made a huge difference out there for those folks. and and. It also eased up on some of the other routes that we had. And the two paratransport units, I mean, that's very exciting that we're able to take care of those people. So I just appreciate how open your doors have been and how quickly you get me the information that I need. And the fact that we can better serve, you know, our elderly and our disabled folks is amazing. And, and I, I'm not sure if our county manager spoke with you, but it's, it's on the top of my priority list with roads uh, as far as uh, expanding our system. So. Thanks, I'm sure you. we'll be meeting soon. Thanks. And I promise I won't Sounds hammer great. you too much about the bus shelters. I'll let everybody else do it. <laughs> well, I'll, let the, I'll leave it up to the municipalities. <laughs> if I, 
if I can just say, right, a, say a little bit more. Uh, Jim Liesenfeld had, had a pretty good system and a lot of experience with, with the shelters. And his approach was, I, again, first come, first serve with the cities. And, then, and so then, you know, Cocoa Beach got a batch of, of uh, bus shelters. And they didn't, he didn't try to kind of ease around to different places. The other, everybody else had to wait, one city at a time. It was, it almost, I would say it kind of averaged about one city a year. So it was kind of slow progress. What happened when Jim left was, you know, everything kind of ground to a halt for a little while, and I'm just being transparent with you regarding that particular project. And so then we had, we had, you know, requests from all over the place. And I tried to kind of balance those and sort them out. And I, so it wasn't near as methodical as when Jim used to do it. I'll, I'll be the first to admit to all of you. And so then, and so that's why it's a little random over here and over there, you know. And, and I'm, it's an attempt to be fair, you know, and not put somebody off for five more years or something like that. But it may not be satisfactory, sir. All right, Commissioner um, Lober. Just something to think about, and I, I'm not saying it's necessarily the best idea in the world, but if you have CRAs or municipalities that are willing to chip in a substantial portion of the cost, you may be able to leverage the dollars you have a little more by considering that. Again, okay. I'm not saying that's necessarily the way to go, but just something to think about. Sounds good. Yeah. Appreciate it. The cities need to reach out, too. Mr. Jordan? Yeah. How much does the shelter cost? Each shelter located, the shelters themselves cost about five, $6,000. But the projects with the permitting and the land development and so forth is an average of about 30000 They're pretty pricey, very mm -hmm. expensive. So. Yeah. All right, Mr. Forrester. Yeah. Um, I, I would, as Commissioner Lover said, I would encourage the cities to work with these folks. Uh, it took us a while. It was a process, but we were able to turn an eyesore property uh, in Rockledge into probably one of the best bus stops in the county. Yeah, um, for real. We took out an old car wash, one of those old single things with the guy where you spray your car, took that out, put in a, a stop where the bus could actually get off of the road mm -hmm. um, and pull away so that the passengers could get on the bus safely and traffic wasn't blocked up. So uh, all I'm saying is, you know, think out the outside of the box when you're considering this kind of stuff. This was a partnership between the city of Rockledge Most uh, and the county, and uh, <coughs> so think outside the box and think of, you know, maybe you've got a piece of blighted property that needs to be cleaned up and is a half a block from an existing bus stop. They'll move the bus stop a half a block <coughs> for you if it will help you uh, deal with a situation like that. All right, Commissioner um, Lober. Yeah, just one other thing as well, and I just want to kind of uh, tack on to what Scott had mentioned with respect to the cost. Not all of the bus stops are created equal in the sense that you have different costs depending on what you want. If you want a trash can, they are prohibitively expensive oftentimes. I never realized that a trash can could cost more than a few hundred bucks, but they do. Plus, in addition to the cost of the can, there's a cost to collect it. Um, if you want some kind of a fancy enclosure, it's more. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it that, quite frankly, I didn't know about until just a few months ago. So you, you really, I mean, you have a situation where the sky is the limit in terms of what you can spend for a bus stop. Not to say that you have to spend that. Right. Right. For a simple bus stop, you can yep. spend a, a four-digit number and get that. But if you want something that's, that's really going to improve an area or perhaps address blight and clean it up, you really could stand to spend north of $10,000. Okay. All right. All right, Mr. Jordan. Appreciate you. Yeah, just one other thing. Please understand, I wasn't trying to get on you or anything like that. I think you're no a very honest taken. person at all. I'm just thinking it just sounds like the process just needs to be on. That's all. I'm, I'm I'd saying. like to take your side afterwards. I have okay. something to share with you. Okay. okay. Thank all right. you. Very good. Yeah. All, right. all right. Next Thanks. is 3E, uh, Florida Department of Transportation report, Jamie Kersey. <laughs> Welcome. We won't beat you up. To, you know. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Jordan. <laughs> All right. Hi, um, I'm, my name's Jamie Kersey. I am the with the Florida Department of Transportation. I am the MPO liaison to Space Coast. Um, 
the only updates I have for you are, have been provided to you in your uh, agenda packages or your construction and maintenance uh, updates on your projects that are going on in your area. And just to remind you, you can always go on to CFL Roads to get any mm -hmm. kind of uh, lane closure updates in your area um, and, and keep track of your projects going on. Um, but other than that, I have okay. no other updates. All right. Do you have any questions for yeah. me? Yeah, Mr. Jordan, do you have any questions? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for that report. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's only a joke, uh, Mr. Jordan. All right, next is the consent agenda and Georgiana. There are six items on the consent agenda, so I'll read them aloud for the record, and they can be passed as one motion. 4A is the approval of the TPO Governing Board meeting minutes of December the 12th, 2019. 4B is the committee appointments, and we do have an add-on with uh, some additional appointments at your place. 4C is approval of tra the transit asset management plan. 4D is our finance and budget. It's the fiscal year 19 fourth quarterly report. 4E is approval of the First Amendment to the Restated Interlocal Agreement for creation of the TPO. And 4F is resolution 20-10, Space Coast TPO safety performance measures and targets. And this is to continue supporting the FDOT safety targets of zero fatalities and zero uh, serious injuries for 2020, which is consistent with the board's adoption of our Vision Zero uh, plan last July. All right, thank you, Georgiana. I'll need a motion. Madam Chair, I'd move to pass it less item C, just to get a little more info from staff. Second. All right. All right, I have a motion for approval of the consent agenda A through F, except for C by Commissioner Lober, second by Mr. Jordan. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Um, we'll remove uh, 4C and Mr. Uh, Commissioner Lober. I was just hoping staff could give us a little more info on it. I, I read this, and I, I just didn't really feel like I had a great grasp on it. A little bit of both would be great. The, the, the two experts Thanks. are walking up right now. <laughs> So basically we are required by FTA to have the report come through here as well as also Space Coast Area Transit is required by FTA to create this report. And so that's the reason why it's passing through our boarding committee. And essentially what it boils down to is FHWA and FTA have been working on moving <coughs> transportation in a much more performance measured base practice. So we basically addressing some of the concerns that Mr. Jordan had in regards to being more subjective is it makes it where things are created a little bit more streamlined in the sense of it's data driven um, and so essentially this is one of those requirements that through that process we are having to do and I will let Scott discuss <laughs> the actual report. Well it was it was first unveiled or you know notice of rulemaking by the FTA in um, I think 2016 and they gave a year and a half's notice that every transit system in the country is going to need to have a transit asset management plan. The main purpose of it, the origin of it as I understand was the big cities that had rail systems that were getting a lot of federal capital grant money to replace rail cars and everything hadn't really done that and upgraded tracks and bridges and things like that and so they're wondering what happened to all this federal grant money you know and so that trickled down to the bus systems as well and so the uh our everybody's initial transit asset management plan was due about october of 2018 and then there's an annual update every year after so we composed ours in you know and it needs to be approved by the tpo no, 120 days. Yeah, and the purpose is to show this, the state of good repair, the status of your current equipment, all your buses and facilities too that have been paid for by federal grants, and then your, your plan for replacement. You evaluate the condition, and then if it needs to be replaced, what's your replacement plan? How are you going to program in grants, request grants? And they, they mainly wanted oversight, I think, into, into how you're taking care of that federal money for the taxpayers. And it's, you know, it's, it's a, I understand the rationale of it, the reason. I appreciate it. I'll go ahead and move to approve it. All right. Second. 
Uh oh. I have a motion for approval of um, 4C by Commissioner Lober, second by, and I'm not sure, uh, by Mayor Williams. Discussion? Seeing none. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Next is presentations under 5, 5A, the 2020 census counting every resident. Good afternoon. Um, does anyone know if I just click? Space bar. Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right. I'm here to share a little bit of information about the census with everyone and how we can kind of participate in this capacity in this arena. The, seven, the census has been happening every 10 years since 1790. We, every 10 years we take a population count of everyone that's living in the United States. Hello. It's important for two reasons. First, we like to say it boils down to the power and the money. The power is how many seats we get allocated in the House's representatives. In 2010, Florida gained two additional seats in the House due to our increase in population. We are slated to gain additional seats if we get our count accurately done. That's important because that's how we affect legislation here. It's how we get things passed in the House for us on behalf of our state. Also, the reapportionment is going to happen. I'm sorry, redistricting is going to happen in 2021, which is also very significant to our local um, government. The money that we're talking about is over $465 billion in federal funds that's allocated based on our census population. It goes to programs such as roads and highways, transportation, hospitals, schools, Head Start, Pell Grants, the list goes on and on. Obviously the most pertinent programs here are roads and highways and our transportation. So that's something that we, is really significant to us. The amount of money is about $7 trillion for the decade. We only have one opportunity to make sure that everyone's counted so that way we get our appropriate share of the funds. This is currently how we did. On national average, they mailed back at a rate of 72%. In Florida, it was a little bit higher at 74. Um, Brevard did really well at 79, which was a 1% increase, but obviously that's still two in every 10 people did not respond to the census. So that's a lot of money that we're leaving on the table for our particular area. So we want to make sure that it is coming into our communities. This census is gonna be a little bit different. It's gonna be the first time that it's available online. So you can go on your smartphone, your iPad, your Surface, anything that can access the internet and you can respond. The secondary method is gonna be a 1-800 number where you can actually call for assistance in language. We're excited by these two kind of moves forward because we're gonna be able to offer it in 12 languages. So you can go on the internet or you can speak to someone in the phone in those same 12 languages. So we're hoping that people who previously have not responded due to linguistic barriers can actually now respond. If you don't respond by April 8th, we will mail you a traditional questionnaire. So we do want people to know that. It's important to note that the census is never gonna ask for certain things. We're never gonna ask for your full social security number. We're never gonna ask for a PIN, a password, money, or anything on behalf of a political party. We don't ask for any sensitive data or money. We want people to know that. This information is private and confidential to our department. We do not share it with any other federal entity. We don't share it with local governments, zoning, housing, nothing. Title 13 is a law that says that we don't have to. Although we can request administrative records to get an idea of what 100% is, we don't share our records. And the idea behind that is they felt that if people feared retribution, they wouldn't answer the census and then money wouldn't go to the communities as needed. So we want people to know that. What we've noticed about um, the areas that typically don't respond, they typically have high percentage of renters, high concentration of young children, seasonal or campgrounds, mobile homes. These are all things that we've noticed in areas that traditionally do not answer the census. And typically a lot of times these populations are using our transit system. So we wanna make sure that we're engaging them at different levels and different points where they can actually see information and know about the census. This is a low response score map. It's essentially a map that shows the state of Florida along with some of the counties. The more orange the area, the harder to count. The yellow areas are kind of a little bit less hard to count, but we still have a low response rate. So we want to make sure that we're increasing those. How do we go about outreach? We form complete count committees at the state, the county, and the city level. Brevard has a complete count committee. We engage with local individuals, trusted voices within the community to determine how to get this message out. We also engage with different uh, entities within local government because there are also opportunities where placement of information, placards, digital signage can go out as well to let people know about the census. 
The census is also the largest peacetime operation, so we do want to let our residents know that there are jobs available to them. They are available to be applied for until the end of the month, so we do want to share that information. There is a high pay wage. They pay weekly, so we want to engage our residents in that manner as well. That's my contact information. If there's anything that I can provide, I'm happy to share information, anything digital, if there is anything that you can do to get this information out in any of your entities or any of the mm -hmm. transportation points, we are really excited to work with you, ensure that that is another touch point for people to know about the census. All right, thank you, Chana. Any thank questions you. for Chana? Uh, Mr. Jordan. Yeah, I, I don't understand your email address. What's the rest oh, of it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> At 2020census.gov. I apologize. It must have gotten cut off. I'm sorry. That's a good question. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At 2020census.gov. Okay. Yeah. Very yes. good. Thank you. Thank you. I Thank you. Oh, uh, Mayor Williams. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Sure. Um, could you mention the, the rate of pay? Um, yes, it starts at $18 and up. Okay, and then also wow. um, I was told that you can kind of make your own hours as well, is that? Yes, that okay. is correct. We moved to a 24 hours operation and because we need so much assistance and help, we do allow people to tell us what hours they're available and what days. We also, it wow. works for students, retirees, moms who are re-entering the workforce. It allows for that flexibility. Okay, thank you. All right, that's it. Any other, uh, Mr. Jordan. What exactly does the uh, census person do? There's a number of jobs available. We have area census offices that where our field staff report to. So you, address canvassing is something that just wrapped up where they actually verified our master list of addresses. We have enumerators. Those are the people that actually knock on doors. We have clerical staff, IT, because the area census offices run almost like a business. So we have that sort of staff wow. as well. Recruiting. <coughs> recruiting will then move into, so once recruiting is done at the end of the month, because we have to stop recruiting at some point, they move into being mobile questionnaire assistance people, and so they'll be at various locations where they can assist people with filling out their questionnaire. So, so there's a number of jobs available. Okay, so as far as IT is concerned, I'm just mm -hmm. thinking about data entry and all that. Is that something they can do from their home or they have to go someplace? To you're typically it? home based, so you'll leave from your home, but typically mm -hmm. if you're doing IT, you're actually at the area census office. Okay. Cool. And how do we find where the census offices are, like in the city of Tattoo? Um, I can email that to you or I can send that to you. They, there's not a published list of addresses oh, because, really? right, okay. um, because we create the offices and then they dissipate once the census is over, but I can provide that list to you. Okay, I'll give you my card. Okay, excellent. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great report. Uh, item 5B, the US-1 corridor planning study, FDOT. Um, Georgiana, who's going to report on that? Uh, Jesse and Heather. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Heather Garcia. I'm with the Florida Department of Transportation. I work in the Planning and Environmental Management Office. I oversee the corridor uh, studies and concept development studies for the department. We're here to talk to you today about our US-1 corridor planning study, and I'd like to introduce our team to you, which is Jesse Bluen, who is our consultant project manager, and Ennis Davis as well. He's our in-house project manager, and with that, I'll let Jesse okay. over. Very good, welcome. Chair and members of the board, we certainly appreciate your time. So I'm here to tell you about the uh, US-1 corridor planning study. Uh, initially, there was a uh, project development and environment study programmed in fiscal year 2021. So as a matter of practice, uh, corridor studies uh, precede a pd e study. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you about the results of that today. The uh, corridor starts at Pineda Causeway and goes nine miles to the north to Park Avenue. Um, and it's bound by the Indian River on the east and the Florida East Coast Rail on the, on the west side. Uh, again, this was number seven on the TPO's um, prioritized project list. I, I believe it's still uh, in, that, in that spot. Um, the purpose of the study is to evaluate future and long-term uh, needs of the corridor. Uh, one thing I did want to point out is because US-1 is a diversionary route to I-95, is the FDOT has um, what's called an integrated corridor um, management system out there, meaning there's currently intelligent transportation systems. Um, dynamic messaging signs, closed caption TVs, and other plans in the future. So I think that's important as technology increases in the transportation realm. 
So here's uh, what you're seeing in today's condition, uh, two lanes in each direction, 12 foot wide travel lanes. Uh, the median width varies between 22 and 40 feet. Um, you have the drainage and most notably, there are no pedestrian features um, along US-1. So what we did is we took a, a hard look at traffic. We look out 20 to 25 years when we analyze uh, traffic. And this section of US-1 is a little bit different. There's only three signalized intersections. So the corridor acts more like a controlled access facility, meaning you, do, you only have three points in which to stop throughout the entire nine mile segment. So with the planned and programmed improvements that are um, either ongoing now, such as Sun Tree Boulevard, or will be going on in the future, such as Vieira Boulevard, you have a very good level of service from a segment perspective. So with that, um, we also took a look at the intersections, which were you know, probably the more critical point. Um, all intersections operate with an acceptable level of service. Level of service is just like grades in school, A through F. Uh, the exception is Gus Hip Boulevard, which I think most of you know is a fairly problematic uh, intersection. However, with Virgin Trains coming on, uh, we are kind of taking a wait and see approach to see what happens. Um, that is currently in the future year at, at an E or an F level of service. Um, so it's something that will have to be monitored as we continue. So given that a six lane, uh, what we call a typical section or roadway concept uh, was not warranted, a six lane capacity was, was not needed, we said, you know, what can we do to implement a potential long term vision for US-1? So what you're seeing here is, is a higher speed curb typical section. Uh, a sidewalk is provided on the west side of the corridor with a 12 foot wide shared use path on the east side of the corridor. You have wider shoulders that are out there today and um, you know it gives you an opportunity to kind of narrow um, your overall footprint, slow the speeds, etc. Um, you know again this is a planning study so this is an idea, this is a longer term vision uh, for what US-1 could be, could be in the future. What we also did was we wanted to say, okay, where are the problem areas? What can we look at now? Uh, the first step here involved um, looking at potentially signalizing the northbound US-1 to westbound Pineda Causeway uh, movement. Uh, many of you know the eastbound ramps to, uh, north and south are in the process of undergoing uh, a redesign at this point. So there's been a lot of uh, talk and, and concerns brought to our attention at that interchange. Um, the traffic signal analysis still has to continue through our traffic operations department. They do what's called signal warrant studies and that would need to continue into the future. Um, at our project visioning team meeting uh, a few weeks back, uh, we were initially asked if we could install a shared use path between Vieira Boulevard and, and Barnes Boulevard. Uh, the shared use path would require uh, an impact to about 65 parcels. So what we did was we were able to fit in a six foot wide sidewalk in that little more residential area um, to provide some relief for the folks um, that live in that area. And fortunately, we were able to do that within the existing right of way. Uh, we're also looking at completing crosswalks at the signalized intersections. Uh, for instance, Sun Tree is being reconstructed right now, but it does not have uh, an east uh, or a north leg of the crosswalk. So we identified you know, very specific uh, locations. And Vieira Boulevard, many of you know the pd &E study was performed about 10 years ago, and there were recommendations to do, um, to in incorporate two northbound left-hand turns to westbound um, Vieira Boulevard, and also the addition of a uh, southbound right from Vieira Boulevard. So that's still in the works. And then, you know, looking at things like uh, quarter-wide bicycle pedestrian improvements um, are, again, more short-term items that, that we can get on the ground uh, now. So we put that all together uh, in a matrix. Um, the no-build alternative is the baseline in which uh, the other alternatives are evaluated. Um, again, as you can see with the spot treatments, the impacts uh, are, are fairly minor and the cost is on the lower side. Um, the four-lane high-speed urban, um, 
a little bit more expensive, a little bit more impactful, you know, that, that would entail a reconstruction. So initially we were comparing the four lane facility to a six lane facility. So the moderate you're seeing on the matrix really now should be more of a high um, cost instead of a, a moderate cost. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, we had our public meeting last night, so that's uh, my mistake here on the PowerPoint. Wednesday was the 12th, so please, please don't come to Rockledge tonight. We had a great meeting last <laughs> night, um, and uh, a lot of, a lot of good comments received. Um, so we're in the process right now of finalizing the project documents. We'll be done this project by uh, March 1st, and then we're going to kind of take a, a wait and see approach with the spot improvements, particularly because of the version trains and, and what the plans may be and kind of what the interaction is. Um, so with that, okay. um, my contact information is here, and uh, Ennis's contact information is also here. If you have any questions in the next couple weeks or so, I'd be happy to talk to you. All right, Jesse, questions. any questions? All right, no questions. Mayor Johnson. Um, I wrote notes for myself, so bear, bear with me. Yes, I don't want to miss any part of this. In, in March of 2019, at a TPO meeting at which the FDLT was present, I took the opportunity to express my opinion on being very concerned about the new crossing lights with the flashing, uh, uh, crossing signals with the flashing yellow lights. Scott Ellis, clerk of the court, was also uh, there, and he voiced his concerns. We both had concluded they were confusing and, frankly, accidents uh, waiting to happen. Mayor Johnson, yes. can um, you wait for those comments on the next item? That would reflect uh, what we'll be discussing on A1A. Do I have to start all over again? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be best. Okay. Is that a, okay? All right. Any other questions? On, yeah, uh, Ms. Minus. Um, section there. The the white area is the sidewalk, right? Yes, ma'am. To just to the left of that, um, next to the FEC railway. What what is that area there? That area is a combination of a drainage swale, guardrail. For a lot of the corridor, it's uh, very wet. In other areas, in the northern areas, there are there are some vegetation, and generally, it's a it's a natural drainage, or not a natural drainage feature, but a drainage swale. Okay, okay, that was my concern um, that if the kids are so are on that sidewalk that they can't get to the railroad. What we would have to analyze is when you look at the larger swales, we would have to look at what's called guardrail criteria or canal <laughs> criteria. And that's if you know water is at a certain depth um, that would be considered in the future, absolutely. And um, in the northern part of the corridor, there was uh, in the last few years the guardrail uh, installed due to Chloe's law and uh, that unfortunate incident. So that would definitely be a focus in the future as this advances. Okay, what kind of guardrail are you talking about? It would be the standard guardrail um, that you're seeing in some sections today. Um, you know, the standard where you have the, the wooden mounts with the, the steel um, guardrail. Okay, I'm just concerned about the safety of us while I was asking. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you, Jesse, right, thank for you that for your time. Report. Great to see everyone again. All right, very good. 5C is the uh, A1A pedestrian safety, and I'll turn this over to Georgiana. All right, um, I just wanted to kind of give some history uh, concerning why the mid-block crossings were constructed on A1A. Um, over the years, uh, there have been a lot of residents and visitors that have desired uh, more pedestrian crossings to get to the beach, to get to the parks, uh, and to, to get across the road heading west to, to, get, to shop. Um, so calls, you know, over the years have come into our office at the TPO. They've come into the DOT office, into the, the, sit, the different municipalities. I know the county commission office has received calls. Um, and what we know is that pedestrians will likely take the path of least resistance. We know that. Um, and so that was exactly what was beginning to happen uh, on A1A, uh, you know, over the, over the past few years. Um, so when a routine resurfacing was scheduled along A1A uh, by FDOT, and that resurfacing was from Pineda all the way to Fifth Avenue, an opportunity presented itself. 
Um, and DOT is very good about reaching out uh, to not only the TPO, but the individual municipalities that live along a corridor, the county, um, to kind of find out, you know, what are you seeing? Are there any safety issues? Are there drainage issues? What is your vision for the corridor? And so uh, the department did that, and this all started back in 2014, actually probably late 2013. So that's when the current conversations were actually beginning con concerning uh, pedestrian improvements and the need for, for mid-block crossings. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, as Mr. Googleman mentioned, the, the uh, fatality of, of the child, uh, Sophia Nelson, is particularly heartbreaking. Um, but in your package, you do have a list of letters uh, from the various municipalities uh, voicing their concern, uh, including the county, the city of Titusville, uh, Indian Harbor Beach, as well as Satellite Beach, asking the department to really dig into this and, uh, and, and come up with some, some uh, improvements that's gonna make it safer along the corridor. And so uh, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Lorraine uh, with FDOT and have her begin the conversation to talk about the engineering side of things. Um, but it's, it it's, it's needs to be more comprehensive, more holistic than just engineering, because it's not going to solve all the problems. It also has to involve education and enforcement. So this will be kind of a dual presentation. Very good. Thank you, Georgiana. Thank you, everybody, for allowing us to be here today. Um, I will not be the only one speaking. We do have um, a collaborative presentation from the uh, TPO. I believe Kim is going to join up. Yes and from uh, City of Satellite Beach, uh, Ms. Courtney Barker will be speaking as well. Um, as Georgiana mentioned, this has been a collaborative effort over many years now to get to where we are today. Um, over the last month and a half, we have continued that collaboration and what I'd like to share with you is, is where we are at with, with that collaboration. Um, it, Georgiana also kind of mentioned that um, we need to take a holistic approach. So there are engineering things that we can do, but there's also enforcement that can be done as well as education. And we're gonna touch on all three of those uh, today. Um, I'd also like to add that we really appreciate um, the Space Coast TPO's shared uh, commitment to Vision Zero. So thank you. So um, up till now, we have installed um, 16 um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, or RRFBs, as we often call them, um, along this six-mile stretch of um, A1A. Um, we've, we do know that there is increased driver yielding when the RRFBs are in place. So rather than just having a striped crosswalk, when you add those RRFBs, you do get more drivers yielding. Um, uh, over 90% more is what we've found. Um, also, um, in any of these areas where we have installed RFBs, if there is not already lighting, we are installing the lighting. We've already got our contracts out and those, are, those will be coming on board if they're not already um, installed at this time. Um, I'll mention now as well um, a little bit about the legislation that has been proposed. Um, FDOT obviously is following that legislation. Um, for these RRFBs, they are a four-lane section, so the legislation would not allow those RRFBs if it passes to stay in place. Mm -hmm. So we would remove those RRFBs and we would be back to the striped um, crosswalk. Um, we would go through the um, analysis to determine if a PHB, or sometimes they're called hawks, but that's a pedestrian hybrid, hybrid beacon, if those would be appropriate to be installed. Um, but chances are we would not have them as often as we have those current uh, mid-block crossings. So um, as Georgiana kind of pointed out, um, people are gonna <coughs> cross where they want to cross. So we, we want to kind of guide them to safer locations to cross. And also when we're talking about safety, we wanna do things that we can implement um, as quickly as possible. Um, um, and obviously as cost effective as possible as well. So I'm gonna go through a couple items today that we are um, going to be putting out onto the roadway. Um, the first two are related to what the driver will see. 
So these are advanced flashing warning signs. They would be at the beginning of the clusters. So um, we'd have, well, we're still going through an analysis on the appropriate locations for those, but let's say that there's six in a cluster that would make sense to have these advanced warning on either side. They would have what we call a, a wigwag flash uh, light that goes back and forth 24 hours a day. So whether somebody has actuated that RFB or not, it's telling drivers, hey, there's likely to be pedestrians in this area, just uh, stay alert. It will have a distance plaque, so they'll tell you over the next three miles, expect to see pedestrians. The next item um, we call gateway signs. So these signs you would have um, on um, in our four lane section, each direction would have three. And these signs are basically telling the drivers, reminding drivers that it is the state law to stop for pedestrians in a crosswalk. Doesn't matter if it's an RFB or just a, a, a striped crosswalk, it is the law to stop um, for those pedestrians. Um, also, these will, you'll see in this next picture here, this is what it might look like um, out on A1A. Um, kind of acts as a traffic calming because as you approach as a driver you kind of slow down to make sure that you get get through them there is enough room to get through but it does um, act as a traffic calming feature I think these are going to be a really great addition um, from the driver's aspect um, this graphic is just um, showing you, you don't need to worry about all the details on the bottom those are just locations that they've been testing this around the the state but when we install these gateway signs, um, we're seeing yielding rates go up even more because it's, hey, something's, something's going on here. Okay, now so this sign is geared towards the pedestrian. It's not just the, the drivers that we need to help um, educate and remind um, how we um, are gonna act in, in these situations, but it's also the pedestrian. So today, just that top panel is what is on. When you go to push the button, it just says push button for warning lights. What we're proposing to add are those two bottom panels, which would say wait for traffic to stop, cross with caution. Um, this is not currently approved by Federal Highway, um, is not in the MUTCD, but we are going through the process of, of getting those done. Um, we have been asked to make uh, uh, a, a panel so that they could see what it would look like um, and indications are that we're going to be able to move forward with with something like this and until it gets approved we've asked if we could do a pilot um, of it to, to see how it how it looks out there so really hoping that we're able to move forward forward with these the next item that we are proposing is um, dropping the speed limit from 45 to 35 miles per hour um, we are going through um, an analysis right now to determine what those limits, those appropriate limits would be. And we would um, ask that the enforcement agencies, FDOT is not an enforcement um, agency, we would ask that the locals help us to enforce this lower speed limit. Um, just because we change the panels out does not mean that the traffic is just going to suddenly go down to 35 miles per hour. They should, but that's just not how drivers typically react. They're gonna drive what they're comfortable driving at. So, with that, I would like to invite Courtney Barker up, and she's gonna talk about the City of Satellite Beaches efforts. Before she goes, do yeah. we have some questions? Oh yeah, Mr. Jordan, yes. I'm, I'm coming back up, but I'd be happy to answer them no, as well. I need you to answer them now. Okay, that's fine. Okay. All right, first of all, you said something about if the legislation passes, mm -hmm. then it is not going to allow for us to keep the rectangular signage. So you Not on A1A because it's a four-lane section, and mm -hmm. legislation speaks specifically to two lanes. So you will remove those signage, and there will be nothing left except the, the cross. Correct. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, because you're going to do that, why would you not uh, put the... What did you call them? The gateway signs. The gateway signs. Those those could probably stay. Those would stay. Okay. But the the flashing yellow that gets actuated by the pedestrian would be removed. Okay. And passes. who would pay for this? Is that the Florida Department of Transportation? Yeah. You'll pay for it. Yes, sir. Okay. 
All right. Thank you. That's it. All right. Okay. Can I jump in here because I, I'm frustrated because I'm going to have to listen to more things that uh, really I have things that that are more pertinent in my my opinion. Okay. Um, I'm going to start where, or actually where Scott and I had both concluded that they were confusing and, and frankly accidents waiting to happen. After that one happened, as everybody knows, a 12-year-old was struck and died on A1A at a flashing light intersection. On January, I wrote to the FDOT interim secretary, Jared Perdue. You have copies of that mm -hmm. uh, in, your, in your package. Uh, basically pleading for something to be done at downtown Titusville intersection where we had multiple accidents and f but uh, at flashing light at the flashing light uh, crossing and only for the grace by, by the grace of God no one was no one was killed I mean I can't put more emphasis on 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 that subject uh, FDOT the, these may be statistics to you but they're my friends and neighbors, as well as my constituents. Uh, you just said what is being done, but you never say when it's going to be done. This has to take a priority. People are dying. Your statistics are great, but we need somebody to get up there and say, let's get this thing done. I mean, how many people have to be hurt or killed before you take action? Uh, you, you talk about uh, the mileage. I can tell you our street is now 30 miles an hour, and we're having problems, the same as Satellite Beach or anybody else. Um, we had a stoplight up there for decades, and it worked. You pulled it out because you said there wasn't enough traffic. Uh, obviously, that was a bad conclusion uh, that you came to, because we have the same amount of traffic and we have this in here and we have accidents and people about to die. So how about somebody getting on the stick and getting something done that stops people from dying? Thank you. All right, Mayor. Would you like one comment? Okay. All right, Mr. Nolan. Common sense seems to have went out the window. You have to get approval to put a sign in, wait for traffic before you cross. Common sense is is gone. I don't understand it. All right. So um, we do have to follow the national standards, which is in the MUTCD, and we are actively working to get that standard change. It's been very positively um, received, so we believe that we're going to be able to do that. We're moving it's forward. Common sense. Put the I've sign. The signs up. I don't. You got to get approval. Approval. Okay. All right. Um, to your points, uh, Mayor, um, is this the Julia in US-1 location? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I have been reviewing that area with um, our traffic operations group since we received your letter in January. Um, I'd like to maybe sit down with you because we haven't, in our um, crash reports, we haven't found any in that very specific area. Um, we okay. did do- from our police department. Okay. I'd, I'd, be, I'd like to meet with them and let's talk through what we can do in that area. Um, I believe uh, uh, Chad was here maybe late last year or sometime last year to, mm -hmm. to and you had asked him about Apparently that. Apparently it was March of last year. Okay, sorry, March of last year. And um, they did do a signal warrant study and a signal is not warranted, but maybe there's something else that we can do at that location, so. I'm with you. Okay. I I'm oh. sorry, but this is the kind of stuff that keeps going on and we have people that are going to die and, and I can't talk about something that's going to happen two years from now because your statistics haven't been done. Uh, I appreciate what you say and if you want to meet with me, what are you doing tomorrow? I will see what I can do tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, got okay. our state secretary is visiting but I will see what I, I can do. I have worked with FDOT. I've been on council for 14 years and I know the pace they work at on, on everything. This is an exception and should be treated as an okay. exception. And the, the other things that I've shown you earlier with the gateway signs and the uh, advanced warning, we are ready to put those work orders in. I was waiting for today to make sure that um, those were the best things that, that we could do immediately. 
um, actually we've got our um, operations engineer here and he's said I'm ready to, to go whenever you're ready to go so we're ready to make those things happen I would um, appreciate from you uh, a note when you make the decision as to uh, when it's being done and I hope it's within this month so the the goal is to um, contract that work here in the next few weeks and then we have to procure materials and as soon as we get those we'll be getting them out so i would imagine by summer if not earlier we are you're going to see these improvements out at these crossings so all right i got with, commissioner lover oh sorry i've got a, a couple questions for you so in, in terms of the eta for all of the actions that you're talking about or that have been proposed what, what are we looking at realistically is this something that we're talking months or well, like I just said, so we will, we've got contractors that we already contract with. We just need to do the work order with them. We need to procure the materials. Um, with the advanced warning, it's, it's actual you know, units that have to be sure. um, procured and made. Um, as soon as they come in, then we'll be installing them. It's, it's tough for me to say it's going to happen in six weeks because I don't know exactly how long that procurement's going to take. Any, any typical range? I mean, is it typically in a certain time frame? Or is this, I, I just, I don't know if we're talking weeks, months, or five years from now. I think we're not five years from now. We're talking months. And so what I'd be happy to do is once we make those orders and we have a more definitive by the end of whatever month it is, um, Maybe I'll share that through Georgiana so that you can get that update on, on how things are progressing. And then in, in terms of the roadway, because I, I understand we have some folks from Satellite Beach, do they have authority to do anything with respect to altering the intersections without FDOT approval? Um, not if it's a state road. So I, I, I don't mean to, to be at all unpleasant, but what are they here to talk about if they don't have the authority to change anything in the road? Let me let Courtney come yeah. up, and she okay. she's the in, she's the enforcement side. Yeah, I mean, the I, education I think, side. I think everyone was looking to hear from FDOT in terms of what their plans are and, and what they're looking to do, but I'm just a little confused. Okay, so let's let Courtney come up, and then a TPO, and then I will be back up to talk about a few other things. Uh, Mr. You. Jordan. Oh, sorry, sorry. And, and uh, this is just okay. about process. Okay. Because it, to me, it it looks like the gateway signs. Uh, could be a really positive thing. Yes. And you don't need any electricity or anything nope. like that. We just need to buy so, the materials. Okay, so the, the process will not be that we will put up the flashing signs first and then the gateway. Whatever comes first. What's it? Okay. That's all I have. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Minus? Oh, um, I'd like to ask the 35 mile an hour, what, what, what significance I, I that means that instead of getting hit at 45 miles an hour you get hit at 35 right <laughs> right but the distance that it takes for a driver at 35 miles per hour once they see those lights come on into break is a lot shorter of a distance than a 45 okay and that's going to be still the yellow flashing yes okay is there any reason why um, we are avoiding F dot is avoiding the the uh, I, I call it the hard red light so I don't would not flashing right so I wouldn't say that we're avoiding them um, to in order to to follow our national standards in order to install a uh, pedestrian hybrid beacon a PHB or oftentimes called a hawk mm -hmm. there are certain warrants and requirements that we need to meet number of pedestrians there's a whole list of things that we have to meet and um, these areas may or may not meet those. Um, it's in a slide coming up. Um, those are one of the things that we're gonna look at as we move forward for, for the whole corridor, looking at a complete streets and what's right for this corridor. Okay, so. do you think that um, for the, the young lady who was unfortunate in this, mm -hmm. that she met those that criteria that the um, all of the um, whatever they needed for that area mm -hmm. that they met those qualifications at that particular uh, intersection I don't have that answer to see if that one would have met or not but I can we can follow up on that okay okay all right so Courtney all right, oh, sorry. Uh, Commissioner Snardi. 
I just want to say, you know, there may be a list of rules and criteria, but who makes those rules and criteria? And I would encourage everybody on this board, I mean, we keep saying it's the state's decision and it's the state, go to talk to your congressmen and your senators. I mean, it's the only way that things seem to get done. Just like our constituents talk to us at the local level, we need to reach out to our people to, to get things done because obviously we're not probably going to agree with DOT on these being even remotely safe because every place is unique. And we talk about the 400 um, Pinellas County um, yellow flashing lights. Who says that 400 yellow flashing crosswalks need to be replaced with hawk systems? So mm -hmm. that's why that number is so large. I mean, if you have to reduce the number of crosswalks so our local people can get to the beach, because that was what drove this in the, to begin with, then you reduce the number of crosswalks and you people have to comply with the law and use an actual intersection or an actual um, legitimate crosswalk to cross the road because there's nothing that can be said here today that's going to convince me that these yellow flashing lights are a good idea so rather than waste everybody's time maybe a consensus because I think we're all pretty smart on how they work and what should be done and I think we all want the same thing we all want access but we all want our, our residents to be safe so rather than waste everybody's time here we probably should go around the room to see if we're wasting anybody's time Amen. you know you know what I'm saying because you know, you're not going to convince me that these are a good idea. Absolutely. So, um, I just, I I'm just trying to be respectful of everybody's time. I'm not trying to be oh. combative. <clears throat> I'm not trying to be. And again, I think the goal is, is there, and I know the intentions are pure, but we know it's not working. It's not working for our community, so we need to come up with a solution, whether it be reducing those yellow number of crossings to make it an affordable switch for DOT and for these cities. That's fine. But I'll never agree that these are a good idea because... I mean, not just because a little girl was killed, but because of the next one that is. So, All right, Mr. Forrester. A couple of things. Um, do we have numbers? I mean, how many people were being killed in these same places before these flashing yellow lights went in? Have they had any impact that we can identify? Um, Mr. Forrester, I think uh, Courtney Barker has some data that I think we need to okay. listen. I mean, I mean, that's my feeling. Okay. And, and I don't know. Anybody else? I'm willing to do that, but I, I, one more thing before, yeah, I want to hear. Uh, before Courtney comes. We're looking at pending state legislation, and depending on what happens with the bill uh, on these things, we, we, we don't have anywhere firm to go right now. Uh, you know, if well, the state says you can't do this or you have to do that, then we can't or we have to. And until we get that, you know, hmm. kind of stuck. All right. Okay. Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, hmm. Georgiana. Um, well, while Courtney's coming up, I, I was looking through some, um, some information uh, from back in 2014 when all this, you know, first started coming up. And our State of the System report back then was really kind of, focusing on what they called, what the Florida Today called it, the uh, Indy Atlantic Danger Zone, which is kind of the area from US 192 to um, Paradise Park. So back then, there seemed to be a very high uh, crash rate for pedestrian or for vulnerable road users in general. Now that seems to have moved up to the north part of A1A in the Cape Canaveral area from 520 to uh, North Atlantic, which I find very interesting, uh, and and so, and I don't know why. I, I don't know if it's because you know there is more of a focus of the pedestrians and the resurfacing and you know the mid-block crossings. I'm, I'm just not sure. Sometimes it's hard to pinpoint exactly what is going on. But there was definitely a shift in 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 the vulnerable road user uh, crashes. For, for what that's worth, but I'll, I'll let Courtney talk. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, I was hoping that, you know, we would be able to come up and speak to you because it is in our city. Um, this is the community that, you know, we live in and we are the ones that actually use them every day to, to cross the road and to go to the beach. So um, I wanted to let the mayor kind of go through the history of why we came up with this plan with DOT in the first place, since he was here a lot longer than I have. Thank you. <laughs> a lot longer than I have. <laughs> if you ever want to get anywhere, don't travel with, with her. Coco, we've seen your city a couple times this afternoon before we got here. Thank you. Um, if you build it, they will come. All right, so Mayor, if, yeah. your name? Frank Catino, Mayor, Satellite Beach. Okay. Thank you, Thank Kathy. you. 
Um, if you build it, they will come. So since 1981, the city has done surveys along with its citizens. And we've done them approximately 10 years apart. And if I took the dates off these surveys and laid them down, you couldn't tell me the ones from 1981s or the ones from 2010 or 11. And what's interesting, the number one thing causes number two. The number one was no building on the beach, buy as much property as you can. Well, that process didn't start really for us until 1991. And it brought in number two, lower speed limit and safe crossing of A1A. It's been something that a gentleman was a mayor before me, Dave Schechter, had fought for years was the lowering of the speed limit. We have a unique situation. In our small two-mile town, we have over 16 crosswalks to the, sit, to the beach. Access to the beach, we have 16. Um, some of them are just walk, the majority of them are walk only, have no parking. We do have a few parking ones. But our town has stayed the same in population for a lot of years, except the impact of building these beach accesses has brought more people to our beaches on the weekends, and especially now that condos are being built and filled along A1A, we have more seasonal traffic on our roads. I can show you a great picture. I didn't bring it with me. It's A1A when it was two lane, and you notice in the picture there's a little phone booth sitting there. And somebody asked me, what's that for? Well, when I moved to Satellite Beach, there was no phones. The houses didn't have it. You had to go to the corner. So we've changed, but I can tell you this process over the time since we started doing these surveys has stayed the same. People want safe crossing. They want those crosswalks. Mm -hmm. They want them to be safe. We started doing this latest project, 2014-ish, um, with FDOT. We started holding city meetings, and we broke our city into four or five, six segments and held city meetings. What, what do you want to see? What do you want to see recreation-wise? What do you want to see the quarter of A1A look like? Because safety was a main player in it. And people wanted safe crossing. They wanted crosswalks in places that were safe to cross. And because the theory in our town was that when you walk to the end of your street, you wouldn't have to walk more in a block two in either way to have an access. That's why we own as much beachfront, excuse me, property as we do. So from a citizen standpoint, the citizens have asked for this for years, for safe crossing. They've asked for crosswalks to be safe. And so here we are today, and yes, we did have that tragedy in our town. Um, and I think we just need, you know, what is that safe way that makes it happen? Um, I can tell you to tell my town, maybe people that, oh, just rip them up is really not what the citizens in the town have asked for over the years. I, mean, I can show you these. 35 have been asked for with FDOT for quite a number of years. So I, I hopefully there's a good common <coughs> meeting of the minds. Hopefully common sense is something, but someone told me it's never, common sense isn't too common. But um, you know that's a little history of my town from these crosswalks and the safety of A1A. We do have the uniqueness of having 16 public accesses in our town. All right, so uh, Mayor, is there an amendment to that bill, Perry's bill about, you know, the four lane highway and- We've, requ we've requested it. You did, okay, yeah. all yeah. right. We requested it through Senator Mayfield's office as well as Representative oh. Fine's office. Okay. So, right. um, but that, that kind of, you know, introduces how, what the city was thinking when we started partnering with DOT on this, it wasn't that you know, we woke up one day and said, hey, let's change the road. Um, so when we, when we put them in, just like any person in this room that has built a road, John Denninghoff can probably tell you that, the minute you change the structure of a road, people lose their minds for six months because you're changing their driving habits and it's, and it's just a change. And so that we went through the same thing. You know, people don't like change. And I would say, you know, 50% of the city, you know, drive on it and 50% of the city residents hate it so it's just that dynamic that as elected officials i'm sure you're all used to so we went through the same thing with this and um so once we put them in you know we had a big outcry and then after they were installed a lot of people they're very well used now um 
we've had five pedestrian deaths from Pinita to 192 in the last five years outside of a crosswalk. So we didn't go run and pull out the road. Do you see what I'm saying? So we, we need to just remember that, you know, these were put in to make it safer. It, nothing is foolproof. Um, but what we can do and what the DOT is trying to do is to make them even more safe. Um, we have asked for, when we turned in the plan for the crosswalks, we did ask for a 35 mile an hour speed limit. And that's um, because, you know, as a planner, um, I can tell you that these do work better at a lower speed, hands down. And so we knew that. And so that's been kind of an ongoing back and forth with us and DOT. And, and so this, um, you know, your efforts um, in contacting your legislature, legislators, um, I know Senator Mayfield and um, Re Representative Fine and Representative Altman had a lot to do with um, helping the DOT come to these conclusions. So I think, you know, I wanted to thank you all for everything you've helped us with and getting that done. But one of the, when you're talking about, um, oops, okay. Um, when you're talking about crosswalks themselves, you're basically, um, you know, the, the purpose of the RFBs is just to make people aware that there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk. It's state law for you to have to stop at a crosswalk. So the, the RRFBs are just there to say, hey, there's somebody in the crosswalk. But if you're going too fast, it's hard to stop, number one. And um, number two, a lot of people aren't used to this. So you're basically trying to change driver behavior and pedestrian behavior. So you're, you know, what did we do before these were installed? I could tell you, it was, you just played Frogger. I mean, there's three to four blocks between signalized intersections in Satellite Beach and about six beach accesses in between that. And if we don't walk to the beach, you don't get to park at the beach if you live in the mainland because there's no parking for all of us. So you all want us to walk to the beach. And so that's what we've been getting used to as a community is walking and biking to the beach. So when we're trying to change driver behavior, we initially put the, when the crosswalks went in, we initially put um, police on overtime to get out there and start enforcing it. We did a lot of education events with the TPO, but you know, obviously it's not enough. And I think um, my police chief's here if you have any specific questions for him, but you know, basically when we got these two police officers approved by council, um, he, he, his presentation to council was, I tell you what, if anybody told me that you wanted more enforcement in Satellite Beach 10 years ago, I would have told you you're a complete liar. Because, you know, you would know we all know what our reputation is. So, um, so we're going we're gonna to keep going with that. And, and we're really going to enforce these crosswalks. So we added two new police officers. Um, we were able to do that within budget. I, I just, as a city manager, I got to brag about that. And, um, <laughs> and then... Um, and then we also will be um, doing a lot of educational events, um, not both partnering with the TPO, but also with, within our own city. So um, we have a youth council that it will be addressing this in the high schools and the middle, school, middle, um, uh, middle schools. And then we have our fire department is now participating in getting the training through the TPO to do the training in middle schools along with their safety training. And the firefighter who is um, heading this up was one of the responding firefighters to the incident with um, Sophia. So he has a vested emotional interest in, in seeing that through. So those are um, some of the efforts that we will be taking and we'll also be working with the DOT on the memorandum of understanding with the speed reduction because one of the things that we have to do is when we start this you know, long-term study with DOT <coughs> and all these workshops with, I'm sorry I have a cold, but um, Indian Atlantic and Indian Harbor Beach, we'll be looking at changing the structure of the road and that takes a long time. So until that happens, people will naturally want to go 45, 55 miles an hour on A1A and we will have to enforce that down and that takes a lot of effort. So we will be working with DOT to come up with that plan. And that's it, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim. Oh. Hold on, Courtney, oh. um, Commissioner uh, Lober. Just some thoughts on it. I, I don't think anyone here is opposed, and I think probably everyone wants to see the, the speed limit drop by 10 miles an hour. I think, you know, I've heard nothing negative with respect to that, but I, 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 at least I can speak for myself, and I would imagine I'm not the only one up here, that while I agree with your comment about folks having an adjustment period or, or losing their minds or however it was phrased for six months after you change their, their driving habits, 
it doesn't take into account the fact that A1A has a disproportionate number of tourists compared to most other roads. And the six month timeline or whatever, whatever the duration may be, isn't ever going to apply to those people because they're here and they're gone and they're here and they're gone. And when you have a system that's just illogical in how it's presented, it's a problem waiting to happen. So to me, you know, and I, I learned to drive right here in Florida, in central Florida, yellow always meant proceed with caution. It never meant stop, ever. And when you have flashing yellow lights, no amount of education that you, you put in place here is going to <coughs> affect tourists from Canada and from Massachusetts and from California or wherever else they may come from because it's never going to reach them. And it's great that that may have some meaningful impact with the percentage of folks that come from uh, the local municipalities or, or certainly Brevard County in Central Florida, but that's never going to impact the tourists to any meaningful degree. And I'm just concerned that in the future, we may have someone that's hit from someone who never was exposed to any sort, any sort of education or advertising campaign that we may put in place here. And I, I don't know, I just, I think red is unambiguous, it's clear, but when you have yellow, it's not what we were taught when we were, when we were learning to drive. I certainly wasn't. And, and I understand that. I, I think with that, that is why DOT really relies on national standards because a lot of the people who are coming to our community have these in their community. I would say Brevard County is one of the last counties to really embrace it, and District 5, I have to say, in, in these. So you see these everywhere. If you go travel around, you will see these <coughs> crosswalks all over the place. So we are, we are some of the remaining few that haven't really done a lot of pedestrian improvements um, you know, to our community. And that's why I, I see you know, people coming out of town probably a lot more educated than we are at this point because you know they've already got the stuff. Yeah. Madam right. Chair. Uh, yeah, Mr. Anderson. I, I did want to address something about uh, flashing yellow lights and, and we see them sometimes in places that aren't these RFBs that we're talking about and it's school zones. But a lot of times they're way before the school zone starts. And I think that's a lot of problems with these RFBs that they're at the point of contact. So there needs to be a lot more warning. And I know she talked about the wigwag right. signs and right. I think the gateway signs are a great idea because I think that is that visual slowdown because it's actually in the middle of the road and these are kind of to the side. When we talked about this at our council meeting, it was more of a distraction than it was a deterrent. So I think if we have warning signs in place 50 feet, you look at the school letters that are burnt onto the roadway, they're 10 to 20 feet long and they say a school's coming up. So if you have something that says pedestrians and you have these warning lights, uh, when we start school zones where schools were never before, we do the police, we do that for a week, two weeks, that starts slowing people down. But naturally over time, like you're talking through education, it does work, but you have to have these warning signs, 50, 100, 150 feet before, because an RFB is not gonna work at the point of contact. The people are already there, it's already too late. Okay. And, and I right. just wanted to say, we totally agree with that. That's why we had asked them to put those signs, you know, mm -hmm. right before the clusters, you know, because we agreed, you know, um, they have to have time to slow down and, and have notice, you know, and that's that was the purpose of that. So we, we had the same exact concerns. Thank you. All right, Mr. Forrester, and then. Um, what I'm hearing from you guys is that you like the flashing yellow lights better than just a painted crosswalk on a road. That's correct. And what other than the, the, the full blown, the $300,000 a pop red light flashing thing. What <coughs> other alternatives are out there? I mean, I mean, we've heard about the, the different devices, the, the, the what are they called? The hawk. The, the, the hawk, yeah. but that's, isn't that the one that's 300 bucks? Yes. I mean, 300,000 bucks a yes. pop? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm sorry, we can't, we don't have that. Well, uh, you but, know, oh, sorry. I think you're asking. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just looking at uh, the the ones that go in the middle of the road. The the, the what is gateway. What is gateway. Thank you. I'm sorry. It escaped my brain. Uh, the gateway signs seem like positive. The advance warning signs seem like positive. Everybody seems to want the 35 mile an hour yeah. speed limit. Uh, so okay. all of those things can happen, and we still don't have to shell out three hundred thousand dollars for a flashing red light. But the other question that I haven't gotten answered yet is, I, I'm aware you guys had a fatality at one of these intersections not long ago, and, and I'm 
sorry for that and for their family. My question is, how many inter fatalities had you had without the flashing yellow signs? Um, we had. Yeah, I mean, you said there three, were right? five. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had five between Pineda and 192 between. in the last five years. <coughs> in our city, we had three. Three. Mm -hmm. And where were they at? They were not in intersections or in a They were not at intersections. They were playing across. Frogger. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so one of the one of the things, and I don't know if um, are you going to cover it with the red light. The reason why we <laughs> are, we have. I'll tell you why. The the Hawk system itself. So we have one of these crosswalks every block, pretty much. You know, at every beach access. So if we have. If, if they are red, like a hawk system, you're, it's a traffic light. So you're stopping cars at every block mm -hmm. of A1A. And that has a lot of impact on traffic flow. And that then also in turn impacts driver frustration. So there's that concern that we, we pull that pendulum to the other side. And that, you know, that, could, uh, that affects balance. And when, when you're looking at balancing a roadway use for multiple users, you know, we're trying to keep that balance. So that that was some of the concerns with that. Okay. okay. I've got Mr. Nolan and then uh, Mayor Johnson. Yeah, Indian Harbor Beach also was wants to adopt the 35 mile speed limit. And uh, those five fatalities, were they pedestrians in the road? Yeah. Yes. In autos? That's correct. All right. Mayor Johnson? The flashing, Follow. yep. Go ahead. The flashing yellow lights are meant to stop people. Why don't we just change the yellow to red? That's right. All right, uh, here we go. I'm going to ask you that <laughs> question too. Um, it is, it, it's not as simple as just switching out the bulb. Nothing FDOT does oh. is simple. I'm sorry. They are a completely you don't have, you don't have to make that. It's a completely different assembly system. Um, the infrastructure for the PHB is an overhead and then the lights ahead of you whereas the RFBs are off to the side. So it's and electric. again the national standard. If, they, if electrics can get to the yellow bulb, the same electrics can get to a red bulb and it won't cost $300,000, I'll guarantee you. Agree, but then we would not be following the national standard. So that's what we want to, no. Question Say again. So it's the, not the Hawk system, okay? But you see flashing red lights on roadways quite a lot, which to me, when I was driver's ed, that meant stop, then proceed when the traffic leaves the intersection of where you're at. Where flashing yellow was you approached it cautiously, there was no traffic, you would go. So is there a different standard for hawks than there is a standard for flashing red? Because flashing red, you can stop. And as soon as it clears, you're not waiting for it to turn green, then you can proceed, correct? So is there two standards or three standards? Is there a yellow standard, a blinking red standard, and a hawk standard? So the hawk is not lit when it has not been actuated. Then it, let me, we're going out of order on our slides, but let me go to that. Did you add that one? Yes, okay. yes. That slide is on the very end. Okay. Oop. Okay, so this chart kind of tells you what the hawk does as, as it's been actuated. So when, um, when, you, when a pedestrian walks up and they push to activate it, it's not lit until they activate it. Then there's a flashing yellow and it's telling the pedestrian to wait. Then it solid yellows and it tells the pedestrian to wait and then it goes two solid reds. Then that's when the pedestrian can start walking. Then it starts flashing red. And if the pedestrian has cleared, then you would be able to proceed through. And then after a certain amount of time, then it would go to dark again, to, to no lights, so. You know, stoplights do that now. You push the button on the corner and it goes red. Everything you just said, and it's the same stoplight that we used for years and years and years. Understand. And, and it works and very well, by the way. Okay. And it doesn't cost $300,000. Okay. 
well, they do, <laughs> signals do, but yes. So can we finish the rest of our presentation and then there's a, the part that I can oh. speak to that. Okay. So Do just from a flowing yeah, standpoint. I, I, Commissioner I, I, is already. Oh, sorry. I have a question. Yes. Or maybe, not, maybe it's more of a statement, but you know, and, I, and again, I, this isn't a criticism on anybody who wanted to provide access, beach access to residents, not at all, not in the least, but it's okay if we've made a bad decision. I mean, or D, if this DOT made a bad decision. We don't have to have 16 accesses to the beach. We can reduce that number at least a somewhat to reduce the overall burden if we want to put in these hawk systems. These yellow flashing lights, I mean, anybody in this room knows that they have those yellow flashing lights at every fire station even. And most people don't slow down because that'll turn red when there's a fire truck. So, and the idea isn't just to caution drivers. If I'm a pedestrian and I'm not from the area, I'm from the Midwest and I have never seen one of these in where I'm from. And I'm not from that small of a town, so these aren't everywhere. If I press that light to cross the road, I'm gonna think it's safe to do so once I hit that light. So it, 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 the onus now is on the, the pedestrian as well, and not everybody that comes to Satellite lives here. So, I mean, that's my concern. And that's and one reason why we're proposing that new signage yeah. to, to help describe I that. I think it's ridiculous that we're even discussing it, why we're not, why we're not taking absolutely every precaution possible to make this right rather than to say well oh, you know it takes you know all this time and education when when I think Commissioner Lober said it I had it written down to, to bring up I mean most people that drive through here don't live here it's a1a for crying out loud I just think I don't know so that's okay. why we're making the those immediate proposals that I spoke mm -hmm. to earlier those things were we're trying to get done as quickly as possible I'm gonna okay. let um, Kim, Kim come Smith. up and then I'll be back up all right and I also have three speakers who want to um, speak. Okay, just real quickly before I start, um, Ms. Minus, in addition to a, sh a shorter stopping distance at a lower speed, the possibility of less severe injuries to a pedestrian that would be hit as well, that 10 miles an hour would make a huge difference. And I just want to make the comment, um, yellow lights are not, are, are not designed to stop drivers. There's a statute, it might be on the pamphlet you have, Florida statute says if there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk, you yeah, stop. You have to stop. So that's what is supposed to stop the drivers. The yellow lights are just to increase awareness, like somebody said. So, um, as you know, the TPO is committed to all types of bicycle pedestrian traffic safety education, and this has also been the case with the RRFBs that we have in Satellite Beach. We have been over there since very shortly after they went in. I wanna give a shout out to Chief Pearson and Courtney and all the folks in Satellite Beach. They've been exceptional partners bringing us water on hot July mornings when we were out there. And I would also like to e echo the sentiments of what the mayor said. Everybody we talked to using those signals loved them. They were like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So the people that are loving, the, the, that are using them, like them. Um, so we were out there, we were educating people, we had the police department out, they were stopping people that weren't yielding to pedestrians and also educating them. They weren't writing tickets, they were educating them. Say, hey, you know, you just went through a crosswalk, you need to know you, to stop. Um, we also, are planning more, more in Satellite Beach, and also more in, we've already had preliminary discussions with Indian Atlantic and Indian Harbor for when their lights come on. Um, we already have the tip cards that you have at your place today. They're already in the schools in Indian Atlantic and Indian Harbor. So we have been trying to get the word out. We also are gonna be doing some other things. We have, um, at the request of the Satellite Beach Library, We'll be going out there a week from Saturday and we'll be talking to anybody that wants to come out and learn a little bit more about the laws and how to be a safe bicyclist and pedestrian. We'll, we'll be doing that. If anybody wants to come out, they are more than welcome. We also do a lot of training for other demographics too because everybody, we're not doing, I, all of our statistics show we're not doing a very good job of using our roadways and, and getting around safely and there's, a lot of things that come into play, but the TPO, again, is committed to 
to trying to get the word out, but we'll be doing a train the trainer and end user. If you want to learn about how to be a safer pedestrian, this training is actually geared towards our aging road users. And I hate to say it, but I'm told that an aging road user is anybody over 50. So oh, <laughs> fat. I'm there. Oh. Um, <laughs> But this, this would be, you could come if you just wanted to, to know more about it, or if you wanted to, to be um, certified as a trainer to take this back, and we're having good, good response to that. Um, thank you to the city of Melbourne's Parks and Rec that has uh, given us the space to do that. It'll be a nice area for them to go out and take a walk there at the O'Galley Civic Center. We have an incredible, you've heard me mention it before, we have an incredible partnership with our school board. Um, not only do we have the in-school program where we've been teaching um, school-aged children about being safe bicyclists and pedestrians, Abby also works very closely with the communications department and, and we have a standing room in their newsletter that goes out, what is it, every quarter? or. So anything, yeah, so we have a, so we're putting pedestrian and bicycle safety in. We also did, um, at the beginning of the school year, we, we put something out, the, this brochure went into Peach Jar, which goes out to all the parents to, to give them that information as well. Um, and of course, we're always putting out social media posts and, and that type of thing. This is, um, right. and just to, to wrap up, um, I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise their hand, but think about this question. When we drive and you're sitting at a traffic signal and you get a green light, I bet almost everybody in this room could raise their hand at one time or another. They've waited at that green light to make sure that people stop the red light coming the other direction. Yes, like I said, do. I'm not gonna ask anybody. So signals don't always work, but it doesn't mean they're not safe. There's a human component to all of this and we have to we have to understand that and we all have to not only look out for the other people on the road but understand the laws and understand how all of this system works so we can all be safe all right. <coughs> thank you Kim so um, FDUT has an education component as well and we are going to continue to work with um, the locals the TPOs to continue to get that message out whether it be um, providing materials or providing our staff um, and we'll, we also attend events um, as well. Um, one of the things that we developed in uh, 2019 was a public service announcement related to um, Alert Today and um, if anybody was watching the Super Bowl the, um, this ad um, did play locally I think around the state um, definitely um, at least in the Orlando Central Florida area so I'd like to show you that now. Yes. Pedestrians and bicyclists are fatally injured in traffic crashes every year. What do you think is a more acceptable number? Acceptable? Um, maybe 50? Okay. This is what 50 people look like. Oh, that's my family. My friends. So now, what do you think is a more acceptable number? Zero. Definitely zero. It's a very impactful ad. Um, makes me think of my little boys. Okay, I don't know how to get off this now. <laughs> okay, so um, what we came to talk about today were a couple things. One was the immediate um, improvements that we could make to that corridor um, in coordination with um, with the city of Satellite Beach and hopefully um, other municipalities as well. But we also recognize, and we've been talking about it today, that we also need to, to think long term. So um, we are working on scheduling a workshop for, I think we're thinking um, early spring, and I believe it's the city of um, Indian Harbor Beach has offered their facilities 
um, to hold that meeting. So please stay tuned um, as we schedule that date. Um, I hope to see a lot of you um, in that room as well. And that is where I think we'll have a really great opportunity to really talk and discuss what are all of the tools in our toolbox, what makes sense as we move, as, as we work on this corridor. Um, and that may involve changes to the actual roadway as well to continue to get that speed down and, and make that corridor as safe as possible. Um, yes. so, okay, so Lorena, I, um, that speed getting it down to 35 miles an hour, what does that take to get that done? So FDOT is committed to doing that. Um, we are working with the City of Satellite Beach, um, like an MOU to understand from the enforcement side and we'll be reaching out to the other municipalities as well. Um, we're looking at what are the appropriate limits for, for that, that speed drop. Um, I don't have a specific date for you, but I will certainly keep um, Georgiana okay. updated as, as we move forward with that. All right, uh, Mr. Nolan. When was the last time it did a traffic count study on that corridor? Um, a traffic count study? I believe we've done one recently, but I don't have the results from that. I've been so, here 53 years and I've noticed the increase in traffic as well as the <coughs> building. I know we did a speed study maybe in early January to kind of understand now the RRFBs are in, are people slowing down, and they're, they're going that 45, 50, if not more. So they're, right now they're comfortable going at that speed. That's why if we can hopefully make some of these other changes, we'll get that, that speed down. So. Okay. All right, I, if uh, I have three speakers who want to un under, under public comments, and we'll go ahead with that. Joel Bassett. They came early just to sign up. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joel Bassett. I live in uh, Brevard County on the Barrier Island between uh, the South Cocoa Beach city limits and the north property line of Patrick Air Force Base. Uh, this stretch of A1A uh, is located in unincorporated Brevard County and consists mostly of uh, single and multifamily residences. Because we are unincorporated Brevard County, we do not have a city council to represent our citizens, nor do we have a police department to enforce the traffic laws. That is why I'm here today to ask for your help. The stretch of A1A is a major corridor for north and southbound traffic running from Port Canaveral to Melbourne beaches and all points in between. As you are all aware, the growth in our area has increased significantly due to the space, crews, and technology industries, thus putting many more vehicles on the roadway. This has also increased the pedestrian traffic and bicycling in our area considerably. Well, I understand that you are here today to discuss pedestrian safety collaboration on State Road A1A as it relates to speed limits, crosswalks, the Hawk system, the color of crosswalk lighting, warning signs for crosswalks, how to educate the public in Indian Harbor Beach, Satellite Beach, and other South Beach areas. I would like to speak with you today regarding the stretch of the A1A corridor that runs between the South Cocoa Beach city limits and Patrick Air Force Base that should be included and be a part of the study. I wish that I was here today to discuss the crosswalks with you, the color of the crossing lights, the raised medians, the warning lights, or educating the public on these topics. Unfortunately, we do not have any crosswalks. I heard the mayor of Satellite Beach says he has, if I am not mistaken, 16 crosswalks in a two-mile stretch. We have zero. Um, you know, uh, we don't have any crosswalks. We don't have red lights. We don't have warning signs. We don't have flashing lights or any other means to help safely traverse four lanes of traffic like our neighbors enjoy. Well, it take before the county and the state pays closer attention. Let's hope it's not another tragic accident to put this on your radar. Here's what's important for you to understand. The speed limit goes from 35 miles per hour in South Cocoa Beach within the city limits to 55 miles per hour at Patrick Air Force Base. I'm sure many of you are familiar with mm -hmm. this stretch of roadway. It goes without saying that many drivers leaving the 35 mile per hour zone in Cocoa Beach immediately increase their speeds to 55. And the drivers leaving the 55 mile per hour speed limit along Patrick Air Force Base northbound don't slow down until they reach Cocoa Beach. It is not uncommon to see a majority of vehicles traveling this stretch of road, including rock trucks, semis, 
county transit vehicles, school buses, running upward to 65 miles an hour. I walk my dog every morning and every afternoon along this stretch of road, so I see it firsthand. Especially when traveling uh, northbound, uh, they just don't slow down. Sir, so, um, can you wrap it up? Beg your pardon? Can you wrap it up in your three minutes? Yes, ma'am. Everyone that knows, uh, at least the locals, that you don't speed in Satellite Beach or Cocoa Beach unless you want a speeding ticket. Their traffic enforcement reputation developed over the years as a very effective way to control the speed limits. At a, minimum, at a minimum, that is what we need on our stretch of A1A to get the attention of the public. We have reached out to Brevard County Sheriff's Department to enforce the speed limit. We have seen little effort and virtually no impact. I would like to conclude by saying we don't need a comprehensive study by FDOT to determine if the speed limits need to be lowered because common sense tells you that it does. It is my request and that of my neighbors, given that this residential area is identical to that of Cocoa Beach where a 35 mile per hour speed limit has been in existence for over 25 years, that the speed limit be reduced to 35 mile per hour from the Cocoa Beach city limits to Patrick Air Force Base and the Brevard County Sheriff's Department make a reasonable effort to help control the current posted speed limit. It just may save a life. Thank right. you. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. I think uh, Commissioner Lober wanted to say something, Mr. Just Bassett. Just real briefly with respect to it. So, you know, as you, as you mentioned toward the end of your, um, your talk, you know, you, you do have BCSO out there. So the fact that you don't have municipalities enforcing it through a, a city's police department uh, doesn't change the fact that there are folks that are available. Um, my office in Merritt Island, uh, just south of 520 on the west side of the road, is the headquarters for East Precinct. Uh, I can tell you that I'm happy to talk with Dan Singleton, who's the commander out there for BCSO, to determine what else they can do. Um, but I, I can tell you, Avon by the Sea, Snug Harbor in particular, they, they do have traffic enforcement, whether it's at the level that folks want. Obviously, that's a subjective question. Um, I did have a question, though. You mentioned that, uh, I guess, in, in, in compar for comparison's sake, that Satellite Beach had something like 16 crosswalks in the span of two miles, but you had zero. What distance are you, are you talking about that has zero? Well, the hole in, the hole in the unincorporated area and that strip of roadway from the South Cocoa Beach city <coughs> limits to the Patrick Air Force Base North pro property boundary. I just don't recall that, you know, even the rough mileage offhand, do you recall it's it? It's maybe two miles at the most. Yeah, I, I can tell you my, my concern, and I, I don't mind looking at or encouraging the FDOT to look at reducing the speed limit maybe to 45 as opposed to 35, because I think you have a more realistic chance of getting that. But I, I am concerned about putting in crosswalks outside of signaled intersections where you have a speed limit that's that high. So it's, it's something I think there are a lot of, a lot of roadblocks, or I don't mean to have a pun there, but a lot, of, um, a lot of, of hurdles that we would have to get over in order to even consider putting in some crosswalks over there. I think it's a good idea if the speed limit were lowered, but unless and until it's lowered, I would be almost more concerned that it would give people a false sense of security when crossing when people are, if, you, if you've got a 55 mile an hour speed limit, no doubt you're gonna get tourists or other folks that get complacent and drive 70. Well, um, there is no uh, public beach access, so everybody is coming over from the river side to the ocean side. And uh, our speed limit is currently posted, it, it starts at 35 and, and, and exceeds up to 55 when you get to Patrick. The major problem is reducing the speed limits. And uh, right now we don't have a raised median or any place to hide. So you either run the gauntlet going from point A to point B or you get stuck in the middle. And you know, with, with distracted driving these days like it is, uh, I've seen them coming off the road and in the medians, and it's just it's just a dangerous situation, and we just want to get it on the radar and, and yeah. uh, get people okay. thinking no, about I'm, it. All right. I'm happy to you know I'm happy to chat with with Commander Singleton, and then I'll also reach out because I, I think the base would have a, a degree of input on that as well. I'll also reach out to a couple of folks over at the base to see if they have a particular position with respect to it, because if if they want the speed limit lowered as well. I think you have a better chance of it. If they don't want it lowered, I think it would be much harder to get done. You know, a flashing speed sign like they have the city of Cocoa Beach uses, is, having lived in that area for 15 years on the Barrier Island, is a very effective way to slow cars down. And if we can just get the tra the spe the, them to obey the speed limit, we would be making uh, major progress. Uh, we've had some fatalities along that stretch of road, too. A couple I'll, that I'll see I know what BCSO of. says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. hopefully we can get something done for you. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you, sir. you. Next is Ken Lyles.
Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to join my colleague in South Cocoa Beach. Uh, we actually call it the Wild West or the Forgotten Shores. It's, it's an approximately one mile strip of land that starts at the north end of Patrick Air Force Base and stops at 16th Street. So it's roughly a mile and a mile and a half. And as it's been pointed out already, speed limit for four miles along Patrick Air Force Base is 55. That translates to 65, uh, police chief. I guarantee, I guarantee uh, 90 to 95% of everyone going on that stretch when they get to uh, past the Patrick, Patrick Air Force Base border, they're still going 55 to 65. And along the entire corridor, corridor, hotels, restaurants, businesses, Airbnb, you name it, everything. So um, getting across that road with cars going 55 to 65 is a problem. And just yesterday, big accident, car was totaled. Wouldn't have been totaled if, if the speed limit was 35. So we want to jump on board with Satellite Beach. <coughs> we want to be included in the 35 mile an hour plan. I mean, I was a safety officer in the Navy. And what I see out there is just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Not only that, I did the math. Satellite Beach has been requesting from the FDOT 29 years. 29 years they've been requesting the speed limit to drop to 35. We had a construction crew out in the same corridor for three weeks. Guess what they did? They lowered the speed limit to 35. One day, that's all it took. I worked in federal government and the military. These things can happen faster if people really want them to happen. So we would like to be included. We'll be brothers and sisters of Satellite Beach, <laughs> but we want 35. Okay. Bad. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, next is Drew Melville. Hello. Hi, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Uh, Drew Melville, I also live in another no man's land called South Patrick Shores, as you all know. I'm a resident of South Patrick Shores. Uh, Berkeley Street is where I usually cross to go to the beach. I'm also a real estate and land use attorney. I've been practicing for 13 years, and I've got my law degree and my master's in urban planning from UF. I spoke with some of my professors and other alumni and folks about this uh, prelude to this meeting. My only point that I want to make, and I agree with lowering the speed limit and maybe switching out the red, yellow flashings to hawks. I've walked some hawks recently in Sarasota, and they work excellently. My only point is, for the signalized intersections where I cross and where a lot of our families that live in our neighborhoods cross, it's mm -hmm. Berkeley and Shearwater mostly for us, uh, you have pedestrians contending with left turning cars. Uh, yeah. now, there's once, and now I'll also step back a minute. I'm, I grew up in Br Broward County. Uh, I've been living here since 13, 2013 with a couple years sojourn. We've moved back and forth, but uh, we've been back here for a couple years. Um, most segments of A1A that I can think of between Fernandina Beach and Miami Beach, which I've been, you know, all I can name the towns, Vero, Boca, Ponte Vedra, these different places, you, if you hit the signal to cross as a pedestrian, you get your own signal, all the cars are stopped, and this is one of the most dangerous things we have going on here that no one's been addressing. But the only signal that I've seen in this beach segment of A1A between Pinita and O'Galley where we have that crossing is Pine Tree. So in front of the Lowe's, and I cross this one all the time, I love doing it because I love making faces at the cars that are all having to stop for me. Um, you hit that, if you're the north cross section of that crosswalk, uh, or north crosswalk of that intersection, you hit the pedestrian signal, all of the cars are stopped, and you get your own signal, the crosswalk users, whether you're on a skateboard, bike, uh, you know, walking, whatever, with the kids, you know, this, you don't, that's the only signal you get this, it's Pine Tree in A1A. The rest of the signals, you've got pedestrians contending with traffic. Uh, there are families that will not cross A1A um, because of this. There, I see it almost every time I go out there to go to the beach, someone almost plows into families, kids. Uh, myself, one night, we were taking my newborn son to see his first turtle uh, hatching when he was about five weeks old. And you know, someone almost ran into me and then screamed at me saying they had the right of way. The people don't read the signs that say yield to pedestrians. But anyway, just to give you a, 
a, um, a quick visual of what I'm talking about. I think you all know what I'm saying, but uh, sorry, they, the Walgreens this morning, all they had was the, the poster boards with the little bedazzled borders, but uh, I hope I don't, get, I don't get glitter on anyone and have people having to uh, you know, explain why they have glitter on themselves when they get home. So uh, anyway, this is Pine Tree, good. You get a red light, the pedestrians get to cross. The, these are my little depictions of cars, they're stopped. Uh, you know, this is the north intersection or north side of the crosswalk, looking great. This is all the other intersections. So Berkeley, Pineda, Shearwater, Jackson, Scorpion, Cassia, wherever you have a signal, you have these green lights and you have all these guys and gals plowing off, taking their left-hand turn, mm -hmm. crossing the street. And I just want to make one final point. It's not just people who don't care, who are bad drivers or who are idiots. It's, you know, including whatever you want to call us. My own, my own wife did this the other day. She was leaving Hightower Park at Shearwater. The sun was going down. She had a green light. She did not see that there was a woman crossing with her dogs. My wife, on Sunday, almost hit someone uh, with her own green light at Shearwater. So it's just an easy fix. I figure, you know, I used to work for the Vieira Company. I know you, cities and counties can make uh, developers do traffic improvements. And, you know, the Vieira Interchange is an example of that. And I think uh, this should be something that's added to the list uh, to fix. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Melville. Um, and that concludes the, uh, the speaker cards. But I do want to get back to his point. And I don't know which cities, but I heard this rumor where um, the, the all four intersections stop. You know, for, I don't know whether a minute or two to allow those pedestrians when they're walking to avoid that right hand or left hand hit. So, yeah. uh, Lorreen, can you speak to that? Is there like a leading pedestrian yeah, intervals? You have one at University of Babcock, or you're supposed to. Well, where is that? University of Babcock, they were because of the school there. When Okay. No, wasn't aware of that. So, okay. So for how many minutes? One or two? Or just everybody stops and... Pine Tree and A1A is 20 second about interval. Okay. I don't know the specifics on how, how long that is, but I can go okay. to our traffic operations group and to get you some information he, he on that. He has a very good point that I yeah. do notice all over yes. this county when I'm driving. It, it that That's right. If it, that's small treatment if that could be done at certain signalized intersections that could make a huge difference yeah, we took some notes okay during the comments uh, mayor johnson uh, i just have a, not really a question it's something to have. i think i heard you say that you can't change a uh, yellow light with a red light would you bring me some information that indicates that because i don't understand that at all Sure. Yeah, that's a national standard, but I can share that for you. Yes, sir. I'm talking about the lights. Now. Correct. The right. Just using the same assembly and making them red instead of yellow. Right. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't have a quorum, so we can't vote, but any other comments or concerns? Seeing none. Okay. So our next meeting is March 12th at 1.30. If there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and adjourn this meeting. At 3.42. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.